extravagant things to me. You don't know everything about me. I think that if you did, even you would turn from me. Oh, you laugh. Don't laugh. Why have you stopped playing, Dorian? Go back and play the nocturne over again. Look at that great honey-colored moon that hangs in the dusky air. She's waiting for you to charm her. And if you play, she will come closer to the earth. You won't? Let us go to the club, then. It has been a charming evening, and we must end it charmingly. There is someone who wants immensely to know you. Young Lord Poole, Bournemouth's eldest son. He has already copied your neckties, and has begged me to introduce him to you. He is quite delightful, and rather reminds me of you. I hope not said Dorian, with a touch of pathos in his voice. "'But I am tired to-night, Harry. I won't go to the club. It is nearly eleven, and I want to go to bed early. Do stay. You have never played so well as to-night. There was something in your touch that was wonderful. It had more expression than I have ever heard from it before. It is because I am going to be good.' he answered, smiling. I am a little changed already. Don't change, Dorian. At any rate, don't change to me. We must always be friends. Yet you poisoned me with a book once. I should not forgive you that. Harry, promise me that you will never lend that book to anyone. It does harm. My dear boy, you are really beginning to moralize. You will soon be going about warning people against all the sins of which you have grown tired. You're much too delightful to do that. Besides, it is no use. You and I are what we are, and will be what we will be. Come round tomorrow. I am going to ride at eleven, and we might go together. The park is quite lovely now. I don't think there have been such lilacs since the year I met you. "'Very well. I will be here at eleven, said Dorian. "'Good night, Harry.' "'As he reached the door, he hesitated for a moment, "'as if he had something more to say. "'Then he sighed and went out. "'It was a lovely night, so warm that he threw his coat over his arm, "'and did not even put his silk scarf round his throat. "'As he strolled home, smoking a cigarette, two young men in evening dress passed him. He heard one of them whisper to the other, "'That is Dorian Gray.' He remembered how pleased he used to be when he was pointed out, or stared at, or talked about. He was tired of hearing his own name now. Half the charm of the little village where he had been so often lately was that no one knew who he was. He had told the girl whom he had made love him that he was poor, and she had believed him. He had told her once that he was wicked, and she had laughed at him, and told him that wicked people were always very old and very ugly. What a laugh she had, just like a thrush singing. And how pretty she had been in her cotton dresses and her large hats. She knew nothing, and she had everything that he had lost. When he reached home, he found his servant waiting up for him. He sent him to bed, and threw himself down on the sofa that not... he sent him to bed and threw himself down on the sofa in the library and began to think over some of the things that Lord Henry had said to him. Was it really true that one could never change? He felt a wild longing for the unstained purity of his boyhood, his rose white boyhood, as Lord Henry had once called it. He knew that he had tarnished himself, filled his mind with corruption, and given horror to his fancy, that he had been an evil influence to others, and had experienced a terrible joy in being so, and that of the lives that had crossed his own it had been the fairest and most full of promise that he had brought to shame. But was it all irretrievable? Was there no hope for him? It was better not to think of the past. Nothing could alter that. It was of himself and of his own future that he had to think. 
Alan Campbell had shot himself one night in his laboratory, and had not revealed the secret that he had been forced to know. The excitement, such as it was, over Basil Hallward's disappearance would soon pass away. It was already waning. He was perfectly safe there, nor, indeed, was it the death of Basil Hallward that weighed most upon his mind. It was the living death of his own soul that troubled him. Basil had painted the portrait that had marred his life. He could not forgive him that. It was the portrait that had done everything. Basil had said things to him that were unbearable, and that he had yet borne with patience. The murder had been simply the madness of a moment. As for Alan Campbell, his suicide had been his own act. He had chosen to do it. It was nothing to him. A new life. That was what he wanted. That was what he was waiting for. Surely he had begun it already. He had spared one innocent thing, at any rate. He would never again tempt innocence. He would be good. As he thought of Hetty Merton, he began to wonder if the portrait in the locked room had changed. Surely it was not still so horrible as it had been. Perhaps if his life became pure, he would be able to expel every sign of evil from the face. Perhaps the signs of evil had already gone away. He would go and look. He took the lamp from the table and crept upstairs. As he unlocked the door, a smile of joy flitted across his young face and lingered for a moment about his lips. Yes, he would be good, and the hideous thing that he had hidden away would no longer be a terror to him. He felt as if the load had been lifted from him already. He went in quietly, locking the door behind him, as was his custom, and dragging the purple hanging from the portrait. A cry of pain and indignation broke from him. He could see no change, unless that in the eyes there was a look of cunning, and the mouth the curved wrinkle of the hypocrite. The thing was still loathsome, more loathsome, if possible, than before, and the scarlet dew that spotted the hand seemed brighter, and more like blood newly spilt. Had it been merely vanity that made him do his one good deed? or the desire of a new sensation, as Lord Henry had hinted, with his mocking laugh, or that passion to act a part that sometimes makes us do things finer than we are ourselves, or perhaps all these. Why was the red stain larger than it had been? It seemed to have crept like a horrible disease over the wrinkled fingers. There was blood on the painted feet, as though the thing had dripped, blood even on the hand that had not held the knife. Confess? Did it mean that he was to confess, to give himself up and be put to death? He laughed. He felt that the idea was monstrous. Besides, who would believe him, even if he did confess? There was no trace of the murdered man anywhere. Everything belonged to him had been destroyed. He himself had burned what had been below stairs. The world would simply say he was mad. They would shut him up if he persisted in his story. Yet it was his duty to confess, to suffer public shame, and to make public atonement. There was a God who called upon men to tell their sins to earth as well as to heaven. Nothing that he could do would cleanse him till he had told his own sin. His sin? He shrugged his shoulders. The death of Basil Hallward seemed very little to him. He was thinking of Hetty Merton. It was an unjust mirror, this mirror of his soul that he was looking at. Vanity, curiosity, hypocrisy. Had there been nothing more in his renunciation than that? There had been something more, or at least he thought so, but who could tell? And this murder, was it to dog him all his life? Was he never to get rid of the past? Was he really to confess? No. There was only one bit of evidence left against him. The picture itself. That was evidence. He would destroy it. Why had he kept it so long? 
It had given him pleasure once to watch it changing and growing old. Of late, he had felt no pleasure. It had kept him awake at night. When he had been away, he had been filled with terror lest other eyes should look upon it. It had brought melancholy across his passions. Its mere memory had marred many moments of joy. It had been like conscience to him. Yes, it had been conscience. He would destroy it. He looked around and saw the knife that had stabbed Basil Hallward. He had cleaned it many times, till there was no stain left upon it. It was bright and it glistened. As it had killed the painter, so it would kill the painter's work and all that that meant. It would kill the past, and when that was dead he would be free. He seized it and stabbed the canvas with it, ripping the thing right up from top to bottom. There was a crash heard, and a cry. The cry was so horrible in its agony that the frightened servants woke, and crept out of their rooms. Two gentlemen, who were passing in the square below, stopped and looked up at the great house. They walked on till they met a policeman and brought him back. The man rang the bell several times, but there was no answer. The house was all dark except for a light in one of the top windows. After a time he went away and stood in the portico of the next house and watched. "'Whose house is that, constable?' asked the elder of two gentlemen. "'Mr. Dorian Gray, sir.' They looked at each other as they walked away and sneered. One of them was Sir Henry Ashton's uncle. Inside... In the servants' pot of the house, the half-clad domestics were talking in low whispers to each other. Old Mrs. Leaf was crying and wringing her hands. Francis was as pale as death. After about a quarter hour, he got the coachman and one of the footmen and crept upstairs. They knocked, but there was no reply. They called out. Everything was still. Finally, after vainly trying to force the door, they got on the roof and dropped down onto the balcony. The windows yielded easily. The bolts were old. When they entered, they found hanging upon the wall a splendid portrait of their master as they had last seen him, in all the wonder of his exquisite youth and beauty. Lying on the floor was a dead man in evening dress, with a knife in his heart. He was withered and wrinkled and loathsome of visage. It was not till they had examined the rings that they had recognized who it was. End of chapter 13 An end of the picture of Dorian Gray by Oscar Wilde Read by John Gonzales W.W.